So how do you sleep? I sleep too well, and I think I sleep too much as well. What do you mean too well? How long? Well, I just I think I need loads of sleep, so I, I need a minimum of eight hours. But then even after eight hours sleep a night, I still need an afternoon nap, which is sort of slightly embarrassing in that old lady kind of way. Yeah. But 20 minutes, and, and I feel fantastic. But if I don't get that 20 minute sleep, yeah. then um, then you know I, I could be in bed by six. But my, my mum often used to say that she thought I had narcolepsy because I, I can literally just mm. fall asleep at the drop of a hat. Yeah, I'm a bit like that. Actually. Try and stay you? with us till 25 yeah. past yeah. 7 if you can. Another one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are you anyway. similar, uh, Lucy? Yeah, I can sleep anywhere, anytime. I just love sleeping. Mm. Me too. Yeah. And how did you do in our sleep quiz? Have you, have you done it? Yeah, well, I came out at 59%, so apparently that's not too bad, but I still had a, a long way to go to optimise my full sleeping potential. Right. Mm. So I'll work on that. Maybe that means I can sleep more. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> on Friday, we promised you an item today about selling your home without the help of an estate agent. This alarmed an estate agent from Sussex, Martin Darby, sufficiently for him to email us, asking us not to broadcast this item. He says times are tough enough as it is for estate agents. Without encouraging people to get by without them. Are they worth their one and a half percent? You should be the judge of that. Tom, Don Littlewood's been to Somerset to see a couple who've been bashing at trying to sell the house themselves. There are plenty of reasons why not to use an estate agent when considering selling your house. The main one, of course, is because it saves on their commission. Typically 1.5 percent for sole agency. That is £3,000 on a £200,000 house. But on top of that, it's not always plain sailing. Last year, the Ombudsman for the industry received more than 8,000 complaints. That was up by a third from the year before. And on top of that, two-thirds of people don't trust them. Eva and Rob Osmond have 12 weeks to find a buyer for their three-bedroomed home near Bath so that they can make a major life change. We're about to uh, uh, move to Spain. We have a house which is uh, being built and hopefully we're, we're, we're looking to sell. So we're talking about a permanent move, not just a holiday home. No, no, permanent. Right, so effectively, you've exchanged, you're paying a couple of deposits, and then, in a few months' time, they're going to be knocking at your door asking you to complete and pay the balance. Yes. Yep. So, are you under pressure? Yes, we are. We are starting to, to get a bit stressed because time's running out and mm. we need to sell this house. So let's have a look around. All the rooms are beautifully decorated in Mediterranean colours. That's Eva's influence. There's a master bedroom, two smaller bedrooms and an attic study. A few things do need sorting, though. Some shabby carpet and an unfinished bit of decorating. But luckily, Rob's a builder. If all goes well, the house will sell quickly and the family will save a small fortune. But to find out exactly how much they could save, I've asked some local agents to come along and value their house. Having looked around the property, uh, it's in very good decorative order. Um, it's an end terrace property, stone built. This property is worth in the region of 185,000. Based on that valuation, they could save 3,000 pounds, including the VAT. So now Eva and Rob have chosen a private sale website. It costs just 150 pounds to upload photos and a description of the house. Selling through this kind of site can be a piece of cake. This house in Cheltenham sold in just 17 days. People can contact you via email to ask questions. Pictures, were, uh, you know, I took pictures of every room in the house, downloaded that onto the site so people could see every room, dimensions. You know, we had to put a bit of a sales pitch on it as well. But, um, but basically, people can ask us questions direct, book viewings direct um, through the mobile or, or on the internet. The website that Rob and Eva have chosen also supplies a sale board. But will this one really attract potential buyers? Tell you what is really noticeable to me. That board is useless. It's so busy, you can't even read a number on it. Look, you've been felt tipping those in, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. Get it gone, get a nice big bold board, big black letters on it, for sale by owner, website address, email address, and whatever phone number you want to put on it, mobile or landline. Get that one in a bin. Because the Osmonds are under such a tight deadline, I don't think they should really rely exclusively on a website. Something I'm going to suggest to Eva and Rob is that they conduct an open day. That's where they leave the doors open to their house, invite members of the public to come along and view it. Now, what I'm going to suggest to Eva, and this is her department, is advertise it, but give yourself at least two weeks' notice. Put it in local.
times in the last eight years. What's the matter with you? Well, <laughs> yeah, I just kind of, I've always got this thing where I kind of wonder what it's like to live somewhere. <laughs> so we're like, let's go and try living in a village. What's it like to live in a town? And, and, um, and also, actually, we really like doing up houses. So it wasn't intentionally, we didn't do them intentionally to move on. Mm. But uh, once it was all finished, it was kind of like, well, I want a project now. I want to do something else. Have you used estate agents all along the way? All along the way. And um, I must admit, I mean, a few of them have been great and been fantastic. But for the most part you, got, you just never really trust them and and for a lot of the time we do most of the work so you sort of show all the people around the house and I kind of think they, they can take their money if they do all the viewings but if they don't then it does seem you know quite difficult parting with that yeah. amount of cash but we did sell one house completely via text which was quite novel mm. quite easy when you're wow. living in 10 million pound houses then that's that <laughs> one and a half percent expensive isn't it Melinda yeah, exactly. you can't, you can't be too careful that too easily. <laughs> but they say moving is as stressful as divorce and death apparently so I mean it's, it's it, you just want to try and do away with any kind of stress at all so if an estate agent helps surely would you go along with it Lucy yeah because I'm quite lazy about things like that and I like yeah. to outsource stuff and I think you have to be really direct with them and tell them what to do yeah. But I'm going to get Dominic Little Littlewood to do my house if, if I ever sell it. Yeah. He's excellent. So. It's very useful to yeah. have a vibe, yeah. actually. Yeah. Outsource. That's so good. You go into the estate and say, I've got an outsourcing opportunity for you. I'd like you to outsource this. That's what I'd say. Yeah, absolutely. Well, soon on The One Show, we'll be having a good look at the state of the UK housing market. If you have a cheap fixed rate mortgage that's about to stop being either cheap or fixed, then please share your woes with us at bbc.co.uk slash The One Show. Well, Linda, a story's been uh, knocking around in the press these last few days about what we put our uh, primary school children through. There's been a few headlines uh, along, the lines of, uh, along the lines of this one here in the uh, Independent. The point being that kids in Britain are subjected to more testing and start school earlier than in most other Western countries, and you're dead against that. I am. I am really against that, actually, um, for a number of reasons. And, I mean, I opted to take my children out of the, the state system, system two years ago. Uh, when Morgan was four, he went to a local primary school. And, um, and I just thought There's that's... There's your kids there. Who's that with yeah, them? Yeah, they are. Oh, it's you. <laughs> yes, but that's me and Morgan at the back, Evie next yeah. to me and Flynn. Um, and the, the reason being is that I've just felt quite instinctively that this was just too much and then sort of since that time um, I've, I've done a lot more research and learnt a lot more about it and now there is new government legislation that's coming into play, it comes into play in September and basically what it does is it forces all um, childcare um, institutions, whether that be schools or nurseries, to uh, start formal education with children aged five and under. It, so that there's a there's an expectation. I mean, it's great in one way because it, it's sort of setting standards that we're asking people to meet. But it's asking children of five to to actually write sentences and, and and sort of begin the process of reading, which I actually believe is detrimental to a child. And that really, until a child is between the age of six and seven, they should just be allowed free play and to be a child and socializing as well socializing and doing all the things that are really important to a child's development yeah. and then from seven between the age of six and seven that's the time to sit down and start using abstract learning like reading and writing because up until that age they're just not ready and they've got an awful lot of physical development yeah. still to do which you know is, is evident when you look at a young baby yeah. and you look at a seven-year-old a huge physical transformations taken place so they need all their energy to focus on that and, and develop their social skills and their communication mm. so skills. So you're nodding, Lucy, but you see you're a bit of a swat at school. You wanted to get in I, and get exams. I couldn't study. wait to get to school. I was one of those kids. I used to cry when I was three because my neighbours went to school and I wanted to know what was going on. So I was completely the opposite and I wanted to read as well. But you know, that's brilliant and that's absolutely fun and I'm not saying that, that, you, know, that you or any other children that want to read shouldn't. In fact, those children should be encouraged and supported all the way. It might yeah. be more fun now if you hadn't taken so seriously. <laughs> oh, don't don't like that. I know. Don't listen to it. <laughs> Like Lucy, some kids can't get enough of exams, like 10-year-old Amy from Cheshire, who's about to set her GCSE astronomy exam five years early. <laughs> Angelica Bell is with her. Hi, Angelica. Hey, Christine. Yes, I'm with Amy. She is going to sit her GCSE astronomy exam this summer, and she's only 10 years old. And I'm also with her mum, Jill. OK, let's have a bit of a test, because you're a bit of a brain box. Um, in front of me is Kepler's third law on planetary motion. Can you explain to me and the nation what that exactly is, please? The square of the time taken for a planet to complete one orbit is proportional to the cube of its mean distance from the sun. 
That is, in fact, right. correct. Well done. You've got an A from me. But why did you want to study astronomy? At school, we got given leaflets, and I was really interested to start off with. And so I thought that I'd take it and see what it was like. So did you need a bit more stimulation from what you were doing at the time? Yeah. OK, now, Mum, there's parents probably watching at home thinking you're a bit pushy and you're putting too much pressure on your daughter. What would you like to say to them? Well, I had exactly those concerns in the first instance, but we've enjoyed the course so much and we've got so much pleasure out of doing it that, you know, those concerns have long since disappeared. So. And do you know what you're going to be when you get older? No, I'm only ten. Ah, oh, exactly. Well, from one brain box up here, it's back to the studio to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, I think Patrick Moore is going to retire soon. I'm going to put a word in for you. Isn't she's she brilliant? She's only 10. You still yeah, watch. She'll be fabulous. Alive. She'll be wonderful, no, Adam, wouldn't she? <laughs> All right, Amy, good luck with that. Thanks very much indeed. Oh, throughout history, women have always put beauty before pain. We have, you know. But it turns out that objects of desire like handbags and shoes could be causing us serious long-term damage. In practical heels, yes. such as these. Possibly. And if you, if you can just look <laughs> down there, Melinda and Lucy, I've got high heels. I don't understand it. It really bugs me. Every day on this show, we have women come on, they're sitting down throughout, you can't see their feet anyway, and they always wear enormously high heels. I just don't get it. Why? Oh, nice. You could come on in your slippers and be comfortable. Yeah, Nobody would know. We, know. we would know. That's the difference. It's not, just the, it's not just the shoes either. Apparently, in, in, in some women's handbags, they're carrying the equivalent of three house bricks. <laughs> Which and there's nothing in those bags anyway. <laughs> Lip gloss weighs a ton eventually. <laughs> yes, Lucy right. Siegel looks at the price women pay to look good. I like to think of myself as a fashion forward on trend kind of girl, but fashionistas beware. Following the latest trends can not only damage your bank balance, it can also be harmful to your health. Yes, you did hear me correctly. Oversized bags and killer heels are being blamed for a catalogue of health issues. In fact, according to some in the medical professions, they should come with a health warning. Take these so-called it bags, beloved of many A-list celebrities. But boy, can we fill them. Many bags weigh in at more than five pounds. I've come to Manchester armed with a set of scales to weigh up the bag situation find out what on earth we carry in them and see why osteopaths and chiropractors are so concerned. This is a nice bag. May I? My goodness. My goodness, girl. What are you carrying around? All the essentials. A whole can of hairspray. Yeah, yeah. yeah you need a lot of eyeshadow, glitter eyeshadow in exams. Yes. yes. It's a lovely bag, but I'm guessing that style is more more significant in your life than practicality so you've got some shopping in here another heavy purse perfume see that's weighing you down it's glass it's very heavy it's very very <laughs> heavy okay well that's pretty much near eight pounds that's a lot of that's a lot to be carrying around young lady why do you do it I don't want to, but I just need everything. Tell me, what does this bag say about you? It says I pack it with all sorts and I can never find nothing in it. Do you mind if I just have a look at what your essentials are? OK. Cagoule, that's quite practical. Water. Yeah, whole thing of perfume again. OK, that's, again, over £7. That's, that's quite heavy. Now, just, just as a comparison, I've got my handbag. Mine's about £5, about the average weight. And in mine, I have... A sack of spuds. <laughs> Your bag weighs more than carrying around a bag of potatoes. So exactly what damage are we doing to our bodies by hauling a super-sized bag around town? Osteopath Emmanuel Samet can give us the lowdown. The weight she's carrying with her bag is compressing her structures there. The more pressure she puts on that side, the more pressure on the nerve and the more feelings she will get down the leg experience of sciatica. This is the handbag of the moment. Um, I do carry a lot in it. It is big um, and it is quite heavy, but it's got everything in it that I need day to day. I carry my book, carry my water, my makeup, my keys, my phone. At the moment, it is hampering what we're doing and um, carrying the bag as heavy as it is, always on the right side. It's going to be a battle between your improvement and the bag actually holding us back. It's a different story where shoes are concerned. A recent study has said that high heels tone the legs and really do make us sexier. Foot experts like Shapiwe disagree. 
and even say flat shoes can cause problems too. They don't offer much support for the foot. Even in the arch of the foot, they, they may cause the foot to roll inwards slightly and put a lot of pressure on the sole of the foot as well. These aren't suitable either. They're not suitable for day-to-day -day wear. What's wrong with them? The height of the heel, they're more than two inches in height. And obviously, it's not normal for the foot to be in such a position. OK, I have a little confession. These, to me, look quite flat. These are like my <laughs> trainers. Your foot has probably gotten used to you wearing this type of shoe. So, although they're comfortable at the moment, in a few years' time, you will be able to. It seems we women are really putting our bodies through the mill just for the sake of a few style brownie points. But why do we keep coming back for more season after season? It's celebrity endorsement, and we're seeing a lot of um, people like Victoria Beckham and Christina Aguilera and all these people that aspire, you know, that are fashionable, uh, people are aspiring, aspiring to be. They see them in these high heels and think that they're working in them as well, and they're not, are they? They're just getting out of a car and going to an event. It seems we are, year on year, yeah. going more extreme. Higher, higher. Yeah. I, it's just to look good, isn't it? So, if you're dedicated to fashion but don't want wags elbow or calloused feet, here are some tips. Less is more. Fill your bag only with what you need. Is that bottle of water really necessary? For everyday wear, make sure your heels are no higher than four to five centimetres. That's about two inches. And until rucksacks become the next must-haves, alternate your bag from shoulder to shoulder. But Lucy, you're looking good. You see, that's the Thanks. bottom line, isn't it? But it's, these bags aren't just bad for your back. I mean, they can just house no. all sorts of germs yeah, and bad Yeah, apparently things. they harbour all sorts of diseases, especially in lip glosses and loose change, which are very, very uh, insidious things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you need to make sure that you clean out your bag. Otherwise, they can have all sorts of nasty things in them. Like, yeah. such as <laughs> E. coli, herpes, MRSA and salmonella. This is serious. These are serious things. Imagine carrying yeah. that about with you. Well, I don't, I don't know. I've never been inside a handbag. I'm certainly not going to be looking <laughs> through one either. Put all that in there. I am a bit. I imagine yours being full of whole foods like lentils and tofu and stuff oh, like that. Oh, would you just I leave think you've got a very stereotyped view I have, of me, yes. Actually. Yes, but just those, just those stuff, That stuff is perishable, so you want to be careful with yeah. it. Yeah, I've probably got mice in my handbag. Becky Walsh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Now, let me just get this right. You're a psychometrist. Yes, that's right. I yeah. didn't even know what that was. Briefly tell me exactly what you do then. Well, you know when people describe as having a bit of a vibe about them? Yeah. Well, in your life you're made of a vibration, so your personality comes out. And of course there's more space in an object than matter. So your vibe, your personality, your energy gets absorbed into things like handbags, like watches, handbags. Okay. anything. So we've got Lucy and Melinda's bag here. Do you want to have Lovely. a little yeah. touch and you can tell we'll us what you think? Secrets, so you know, should be all right. Goodness. Um, obviously, very, very bubbly, outgoing, vivacious personality, but there's a very, very strong, serious side. And I have to say that it would be very difficult if we got on the wrong side of you. Oh, my God. Oh, you're really? like a lioness. You, you, you really are. You, you can tell that just strong... from feeling up the handbag. <laughs> just from feeling up the handbag. I'm not going inside of it, because not now is I've heard of the first thing. Is it MRSA? No, no, thank you very much. You can have that one back. Good. So, uh, Interesting. Like that. Yeah. Lioness inside. <laughs> do you know what I'm doing yeah. from that? She needs a new bag. Is the first thing. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, so it's it's elongated. Exactly. It's quite heavy. It's quite yeah. heavy. Yeah. It's, quite yeah. heavy. Um, stuff. it's got character, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> this, you, you have a different aspect to what most people see. I mean, you come across as being quite analytical, but actually, you've got a really soft, sensitive side. Oh, so I don't I think, think you take so much of the Mickey yeah, out of it. Yeah, she's really sensitive. Okay, yeah, 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 that's okay. okay. And can you sort of look ahead? I mean, from these energies, Becky, can you kind of sense that you know this might happen to you with this buy? I mean, is there a kind of a sense? No, I don't tend to predict futures with things like that because I, I think it's never set in stone. So when most psychics predict futures, that's not the way I work. Uh -huh. I really like to be able to get to grips with someone's past because by holding an object, I can actually see someone's history. Oh, and okay. it works a bit like psychotherapy. So when you can see somebody's history, you can help remove blocks in their life to make the future the way you want it. Absolutely. Perfect. Did we bore you sufficiently Not at all, there? no. I'm oh, fascinated by those vibrations. Okay. Thank you uh, very much indeed. That's it for Thank tonight. Um, tomorrow we've got not one, but uh, two comedy legends in the form of French and Saunders. We'll be fitting their vibrations. Yeah, Michael Mosley will be sleepwalking. And we'll be wondering whether thongs are good things. See you tomorrow at 7. Bye. Bye. Bye.